For this What's Neat this week, it's June. Boy, summertime's here and it couldn't have came soon enough for us. I've got a really special guest tonight that I want to introduce and it's somebody that's extremely influential in the hobby. This is somebody that every manufacturer and every other publication in the print form, they're always watching to see what Joe Fugate at Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine is doing. He's on the cutting edge with the first internet publication that's really taken off, has proven to be a success, lots of advertisers and great quality content every single month. Model Railroad Hobbyist. So with that, let me introduce to you, I've got Joe Fugate here in the studio with me. Joe, are you there? Well, hi, Ken. Yeah. Hello, Joe Fugate. I think you might have heard that introduction, and you are the man that is behind the revolution that is the Model Railroad Internet Magazine, Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine. Tell us about you and what, what's going on, Joe, with Joe. Well, you know, just thinking we've been publishing MRH for six years now. That's pretty amazing to think that uh, started all the way back in 2009. And, uh, you know, here it is, 2015. Uh, the big thing that I'm looking forward to right now, though, is actually the NMRA convention this August. Uh, I'm going to have my layout on display. Uh, I'm going to have an op session where people that are guests from out of town can come and run trains on the Siskiyou line. Um, so I've been working on my layout a lot lately. So you'd say you're in the trenches. You're not only just an editor of a magazine, but you're actually in the trenches modeling with your fingers. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one of the things that I always have wanted to do with the staff of MRH is to not just have uh, journalists who do model railroading, but to actually have model railroaders who are passionate about the hobby and who can also write and, and uh, take good photos and that sort of thing. So, so, but number one is I want people that are passionate about the hobby. So yeah, we all are in the trenches, we're doing the hobby, and uh, a lot of people know me uh, prior to MRH from my Siskiyou line layoff that I started in 1991 actually. So that's coming up on uh, 25 years, believe it or not. I've seen a lot 25th of 25th anniversary here in 2016. I've seen a lot of videos that you've made on that layout. That's a beautiful layout, and that would be really something great to see if you're going to the NMRA National out in Portland, Oregon, where Joe lives. So tell me, Joe, how many uh, people, subscribers, readers do we have now? Well, there's a number of different categories of readers. We know we have about 50,000 downloads, give or take. Uh, we also know that there are maybe 20,000 people, give or take, that read our magazine strictly online. Uh, so we estimate there's about 70,000 readers in that ballpark That's to read the magazine. We also have, 30, at this moment, 32,000 subscribers. And since the magazine's free, all that subscribing means is that you give us your email so that we can send you an update every week with some of the interesting posts that are on the website. Uh, maybe some interesting announcements from advertisers and also, very importantly, when a new issue is released to let you know. Uh, that subscriber number is actually very important. So every once in a while I get people that say, gee, the magazine's free, you know, uh, would you ever let me pay you some money for this? And, and what I tell people is subscribe. If we get, that, uh, if we get a good, strong subscriber number, and 32,000 is pretty good. Uh, for a model train magazine these days. Um, you get a good, strong subscriber number, that helps us get advertisers. Just to kind of put it in perspective, uh, RMC, Royal Mall Craftsman, as most people know, they, they kind of went through a bit of a trauma last year where Karsten's um, folded, but then uh, White River picked them up. Yep. But uh, in the process, they're down to about 16,000 subscribers now at this point. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, Kambach and Model Railroader, and they're sitting at about 90,000 subscribers. So, yes. so we're kind of in the middle, but we're definitely number two uh, as far as a general model railroading magazine. 
Yeah, really, hats off to Kevin U. Daly and Stephen Priest. They've done a magnificent job with Monterero Craftsman since that magazine's gone through its transition. It's really nice to look at. So, And we really kind of hope that all the magazines survive in the industry because the industry needs all of the magazines to help perpetrate and help everybody continue to be profitable in the industry. So it's not that, you know, we're on everybody's side, and that's a great position to be in. Now, something yeah. else you've got that's really cutting edge that's that's absolutely new is Train Masters TV, the new monthly television show, the subscription-based show. He's got a great professional editor and cameraman by the name of Barry Silverthorne, who used to work for the BBC Broadcasting Network. So it's it's really first-rate quality production. But other than I've just said that, tell us about uh, Train Masters TV. Well, yeah, we started Train Masters TV in November of 2013, and the goal was to have Model Railroading TV, uh, Discovery Channel quality television for model railroaders. And uh, by having that level of quality, uh, not only does it make the content really enjoyable and, and uh, really good just as a modeler to watch, but it's something you can show your family and friends, too. One of the things that we've said is we want to make the hobby respectable again to the general public, and one of the ways to do that is to make really good uh, network TV quality production uh, with model train or railroad-related topics. And so... Uh, when I look back since November 2013, we've now got almost 100 segments that we've produced since that time. And that's all new Train Masters custom produced content, uh, all network TV level quality production, and a lot of really fun stuff. So uh, I'm pretty thrilled with what we're doing there, and we have a lot of great plans of things coming up. Uh, by the way, one thing that's true with Train Masters too is that it's it's uh, started out it's streaming over the internet, and we did a survey last summer and had a number of people that said, "Well, I don't have really good fast internet connection. I'd like to watch uh, this instead of on my computer screen. I'd like to watch this on my big screen TV. Uh, are you ever going to do DVDs or downloads?" And so yes, we're going to take all of that content that's on Train Masters, and if you don't do streaming, but you like DVDs or downloadable videos, it'll be coming this summer, uh, the first year of content, which is over 70 segments, uh, and it'll be in a number of different DVDs, and you can get it different ways. You can get a best of if you want to just get some of the highlights. We're going to put all the layout tours on a separate set if you want to just get just layout tours. Uh, we also have some prototype segments that we've done. We did a, a really nice segment on Streamliners at Spencer, which was a big event was last last summer. And then we also have some how-to segments that we're going to put on DVD. So we've got a, a nice segment on painting a backdrop, and we've got a really good set of videos on weathering rolling stock. So, and so you can kind of pick and choose, and if you want to get everything, too, we're going to do all... All the months from November 2013 until uh, December 2014, so that's like 13 videos, 14 videos. So we'll put all the monthly shows on separate DVDs too. So if you want to get, it's like a six DVD set. So if you want to get that set and get all of the segments, you can get those too. Boy, that's a lot of work, Joe. You're doing an awful lot of good stuff for the industry. It's all going to help promote the hobby one way or another. You know, another great show you've got is What's Neat but with Ken Patterson. That's a great show. I kind of like watching that a little bit every month. You think you're just a little bit biased, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of neat stuff coming up. I'm telling you what, we're working on June right now, just trying to finish things. I've fallen behind. You always wanted me to stay four months ahead, and right now I'm about 30 days ahead. I've been building a lot of laser kits, uh, two-stall engine houses, single-stall engine houses, um, uh, Durango Station. And what's wonderful about laser kits these days is the fact that they go together so easy. The computer-aided uh, CAD work that went into the design and planning of these kits it just makes them a joy to build so I can have some pretty quick segments on how to build these kits as I progress through this. But, you know, 
great job with the magazine. You've got a lot of great guys helping you, a lot of separate authors with their little segments that they write every month. DCC, my most favorite subject that you do uh, is the ph photography, the is this real segment. Just quality yeah. stuff. Yeah. So what I guess can say, so guess, yes. Yeah. Man, thank you very much for all of that. That's that's just great stuff. Is there any any future plans in the magazine before we let you go that you might want to cover? Well, the big thing coming up that we're, we're talking about is uh, actually my 25th anniversary of the Siskiyou line. So the January issue, January 2016, will be the, a celebration of my 25th anniversary of my Siskiyou line. Also, you know, I did these videos uh, on the Siskiyou line and some how-to stuff and so on. Uh, but some of that's getting kind of old. It's like 2004 to 2007. It's a time period. Some of it's timeless. A lot of the scenery stuff is pretty timeless. Uh, but things like the DCC stuff, that's uh, all, almost totally obsolete at okay. this point. Plus, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's changes to the layout, updates to the layout, new, new stuff on the layout, especially as I'm marching toward uh, having the layout ready to show this August. So uh, Barry and I are talking about doing a Train Masters segment on the Siskiyou line, and plus I have some other new video titles planned for next year, and then some ebooks uh, around <laughs> different things happening on the Siskiyou line too. So uh, next year will be in its a 25th anniversary year. There'll be a, a little more Siskiyou line stuff in the magazine and available from MRH as well. I've tried not to overexpose my own layout in the magazine, but given it's 25 years and it's been a while since I've really done much in the magazine with the Cisco line. I thought, well, you know, we'll we'll do some more stuff this next year. So. Man, that looks that sounds fantastic. I seriously look forward to everything else that we can see from Joe and all the gentlemen that work with him. He's got a good team, a good magazine, a really cool thing going, and I can't see what the wait to see what the future brings for this online format, this new medium that we've got where we can all interconnect with each other, talk in chats, and stay directly connected to our editor on a daily basis. Joe, listen, thank you very much for taking the time to help me produce this segment of What's Neat, and we look forward to anything else that you've got coming up. Okay, Ken, well, it's always a, a thrill to, to talk with you and to, uh, you know, because uh, I can remember Ken Patterson, back from the 90s when I first uh, learned about you and saw all your covers and everything. And so now you're a part of the MRH family, and I I'm, I'm, think it's a privilege. So thanks, Ken. All right, Joe. Well, thank you very much. Have a good evening. You too, Ken. It's Jeff Meyer. Jeff Meyer, what are you shooting this afternoon on this beautiful afternoon? Uh, another freight car for weathering shop. It's a Penn Central covered hopper. It's actually it's going to be patched for a Conrail eventually. It's uh, one of the Atherton PS 2893s, but I figured I'd stop where it's at right now since it's still in the Penn Central. And then here, after I get these pictures, I'm going to go back and then patch it out for Conrail. Most all the lettering, the number will stay the same, but boarding mark, all the perils, they'll get patched out and get Conrail uh, data and logo on them. It's a lot of work, man. The thing looks really neat. That's a pretty neat technique on that car. Thanks.
Well, thanks a lot for sharing that with us, Jeff. We Thank love you. your work every time you come by. That's right. Thanks. For this June segment of What's Neat This Week, we've got Michael Buddy, auto rack automobile extraordinaire. And with us today, he's got something just a little bit different. We're used to seeing auto racks and automobile loads from Mike, but this time, he's got something pretty special. So let me hand it over to Mike. Well, it's still uh, auto related. It's automobile frames on Acurail flat cars. The uh, frame loads are made by JJM. You can still find them on eBay or at train shows. But uh, I basically just stacked the frames and made the styrene uh, supports for the frames, glued them onto the uh, Acurail flat car, made the uh, end boxes and the top frames. And the uh, side uh, restraining devices are from the uh, inner mountain. And uh, that's it. It's a pretty nice model, Mike. Now, you've done a lot of scratch building and parts on that, and that's inspiring for the rest of us that want to make auto rack frame loads like that. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Mike. All right. You're welcome. Man, we got a beautiful day today to do a photo shoot, and today I'm shooting something really special. Milwaukee Road, Hiawatha. What I'm doing here, this is a Class A 442 locomotive that in 1935 really sparked and started the speed race from Chicago to the Twin Cities. This 411 mile run that they, they wanted to conquer in, in X amount of hours, and this turned out to be one of the first premier trains that the Milwaukee Road used. Fox Valley creates this model in HO scale and N scale, and coming this summer, these things are gonna come available with sound, which will be a real treat. They run super well. I tested this consist, I put it through the paces on the layout, I let it run around the room a few times, not at 100 miles an hour, but just at a, at a surprisingly wonderful speed that looked good on film. And this train really performed well. She pulled all of her cars very well. It's got rubber tires on it, so pulling is not a problem for this small locomotive. But if you're looking for some historical model, even just to put on a shelf and look at, this is an exquisite model. The Milwaukee Road Hiawatha from Fox Valley Modelers. It's just, it's just a beautiful model and today I'm shooting it and it looks good. Here I go, talking about Great Stuff Pro again, and all the uses that I keep finding for this material. Now, you know on the shows I've used this already for filling gaps in the layout underneath track work, which I'm going to follow up on a little bit more today. We've also used it in the glue test, and this came out to be the strongest glue for bonding foam together. Also, further in the show, you saw me do a segment where I was filling up with the wires going underneath the layout with this material to fill up a routered out gap, which acted as a channel for the wires last month, and that worked out really, really good. So today I want to talk about something unusual. I took a can of this stuff and I threw it in the trash. And what I came up with, what happened the next afternoon, was I had this sculpture growing in the trash can. I actually pulled it out and it continued to grow and form its own pipeline, its own channel and work its way all the way up. Kind of neat. And it brings me to another point that I want to discuss. A lot of times we always seal our foam with foam 
I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, with latex paint in order to seal our foam. And a great, a great uh, feature of the Orange Pro foam is that this material doesn't di get uh, dissolved by spray paint. So you know, when you're spraying regular foam, the paint immediately starts to eat into the foam and it starts making holes in the scenery material. Uh, I've actually found great ways to create roadbed that way by applying a, a piece of masking tape on the foam and then spray painting over the top of that masking tape. The sides of the foam that are exposed are eaten, the spot where the tape is not eaten, so it gives you a real nice gradually melted away roadbed. That actually has worked really well. I've done articles on that. But as you look here at this sculpture, this uh, piece of trash that's turned into a piece of art, it's not being dissolved by the spray paint. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful. And so the reason that I found that I want to do it this way is because when I use this to fill track work areas where the foam's got holes, cheesecake and, and small Swiss cheese type holes in the material, by spraying it with uh, the paint, in other words, by taking the holes, filling it with the orange foam, as I've done in this segment of the layout, look at this section of the layout. This is some of the narrow gauge trackage that I was laying, and the track work had holes underneath it. And so I took the orange foam right out of the can, used the nozzle, and pointed it directly between the railroad ties, and filled in the areas underneath the track work, and then came back the next morning to find that it had all expanded. So simply take a knife or a razor blade, clean it off, then go over it with this Rust-Oleum camouflage paint and then work over the whole area so that I can then cover it with dirt and weather the scene and then grow really tall uh, static grass in the area and literally make the narrow gauge track just simply disappear in the scene. That's the plan in this area and I think it's going to come out pretty good simply by the fact that I can use the foam to fill the potholes underneath the layout and in the, in the roadbed using this great stuff Foam Pro, again, that's not eaten by spray paint. So that's what I wanted to talk about on this segment of what's neat and show you the section of the layout that I've been working on here. And so far it's coming out pretty good. For this segment of What's Neat, I want to discuss foam shrinkage. Now, that, I've, I've actually talked to the manufacturer of the pink foam, and they've told me that their foam doesn't shrink, and that's all good. Uh, I've got a section of the bluff here, as you know, that I've modeled where I live, and today's the day that I'm going to take it down. I'm going to take it apart and put it up in the garage and do some future modeling here. But there's, this is the one section that's never been cut apart since I built it. When I built this, I built it into two sections, and I laid the track right here. And what I did was, if you look at this joint right here, that crack right up the middle of the scene, I cut that crack with the saw. And I came through there one time, and I cut the saw's width, the blade of the width of the saw. And what has happened in the last, I want to say, seven, seven to ten years is the foam in this area has shrank and you can see the crack that I've got that's much wider now than the blade of the old wooden handsaw. So this is the only area on my layout that hasn't been touched in literally between seven and ten years, however long it's been now since I built this. The rails have never been cut apart. But you can see that this crack that was simply the width of a saw blade has in fact opened up to the point where I can actually see light all the way through it. And this diorama is wrapped in plywood on the backside. So interesting that it hasn't affected the track work ever, but this is an area where I can quantify the amount of foam shrinkage and how much the diorama has gotten a little bit shorter over its lifetime of its existence. So with that, I'm going to get out the cutters and start cutting this apart and build something new and exciting here in the next year. And that's what I wanted to discuss about foam shrinkage.
about to close out another great what's neat for the month of June. A couple things I wanted to bring up here before we left the show, and that is I've got confirmation on my electric bill that I have in fact saved 20% this year from last year on my electric. And that's all due to the fact that I've switched over these LED bulbs that I burn all day long in this studio every single day of the, of the week. And when you quantify 20% on a usual spending of $3,000 a year for electricity, that's $50 a month that I'm saving. So I'm going to take it. It was well worth the investment. It's been a year now and it's paying off. Uh, another thing that I want to talk about is we've got the prototype modelers meet coming up here in St. Louis in August, August 7th and 8th of 2015. If you can come to that show, please be sure to attend. There's going to be a lot of manufacturers there. The show keeps getting bigger and bigger every year. It's going to be a center point show at some point where I can see a lot of the manufacturers attending that show. And I may be on an open house for that. So if that's the case and that all works out scheduling wise, I would certainly look forward to seeing the viewers of the show. It'd be great to meet with you. Another thing I want to talk about is be sure to check out KenPatterson.com. I've got to get that in there because I've got a lot of new material that I'm working on. I've done some narrow gauge uh, engine houses, some scenes unto themselves, a one foot by eight foot diorama that represents its own town. Just a lot of different projects that I'm working on. So new videos are coming there. And we're going to close out the show with a little bit of large scale live steam. A friend of mine, Skip, came by and ran some just beautiful 120.3 locomotives on the Garden Railroad. So with that, let's close out the June What's Neat with Ken Patterson and enjoy this uh, live steam footage. Thank you.